Hello and welcome to you all from all across Canada. This is our third community conversation for seniors by seniors. Again, we have representation from all across the country. So welcome everybody. This series is funded by the New Horizons for Seniors program of the Government of Canada. The findings will be used to support and inform governments and organizations as they work with and for seniors as we age at home. My name is Marguerite Thomas, and I am a senior. I'm a nurse, a BSCN, and former psychiatric and public health nurse. For the past 14 years, I have been the consultant liaison for the Fall Prevention Community of Practice, now sponsored by Parachute, the National Injury Prevention Charity. I have worked in injury prevention since 1996. I was also a caregiver for my late husband and mother, and my role today is to facilitate this conversation about being as independent as possible while getting by with a little help so that you can be the best that you can be to be able to live as independently as possible where you want. My co-facilitator is Christine Bidmead, also a senior and a retired physiotherapist and hospital director for geriatrics and rehabilitation. In retirement, she had the privilege of leading fall prevention planning in the Ottawa and Eastern Ontario area. She has always been independent and active playing sports, etc. However, she now finds there are challenges to being as independent as she would, could, and would love to be. I'm sure many of you feel the same, and it will be interesting to hear your thoughts later. We will follow the same format as the last time, with the goal being to share thoughts and experiences, which we know is key to remaining well and independent as possible. To do this, our content expert, Marnie Courage, will set the stage for us, and then Christine will give us a dose of reality with her personal story. Then we will be breaking out into smaller groups with each group having the same questions to discuss for about 20 minutes. Don't worry, this will all be seamless. You won't have to do anything except be ready to join the conversation. Each group will have a facilitator who will report back the main points of your discussion to the main group. We will have a bit of a break as well after the small group sessions before we move to do a review of what you all had to say. I do have some housekeeping details first, and that is that everyone is currently muted. During the breakout rooms, you will be able to unmute, speak, and be part of the conversation. We will use the chat box and we'll be monitoring that for your questions and comments. If you aren't sure how to use the chat, Annie from Cyber Seniors will be doing a quick demo of that in a minute. You can turn your camera on and off if you like. And also, if you're not sure how, Annie will be showing that too. But remember to turn your camera and your sound off if you do need to go for a quick break. This meeting is being recorded and it will be posted on Parachute's YouTube channel for other seniors who are not able to attend. The breakout rooms, however, will not be recorded. You will receive a follow-up package via email with a summary of the discussion, links to helpful resources and the meeting recording. So now Annie from Cyber Seniors is going to give us a tech session to explain how to turn the camera off and on, how to use the chat box, and how to answer our poll. So it is my pleasure to introduce Annie from Cyber Seniors. Take it away, Annie. Hello, everybody. So my name is uh, Annie, as uh, Margaret was saying. I work with Cyber Seniors. We teach all their adults how to use technology. And I will show you today how to go over the options Marguerite was uh, presenting in the slides. So I'm gonna share my screen now. You can see what I see at the same time. 
And I hope that everybody can see my screen now. Just give me a second here. All right. Here we have the gallery and myself. Okay. So if you refer to the bottom of the screen, you will notice that your options are here, right? And, and starting from the left, you have the mute button as well as the stop uh, video. Uh, if you have your video on, uh, the video, when you press in that option, a stop video will go off and it will simply turn off your video. So if you don't want to show it, that's how you do it. So if you ever want to turn back your video, notice how the option now, instead of saying start video, it will say stop video. And now I will just press over and it will take my video back on. So it's as simple as that. You will see that strike through the option when the option is off. When it's on, you will see the icon in a white looking color. Now, if you are using a computer such as the one I'm using, and you refer to the kind of the middle point of the screen, you will find the chat option. And if you want to send a chat, you can just click in that option. A new window will be open on the right side of your screen and it will look similar to what you see right now. Uh, it will show this part at the bottom that says type message here. And now all you have to do is using your keyboard to send the message you want to communicate. For instance, if I say hello, Right. What I need to do after if I'm using a computer is press my enter key from my keyboard and that message has been sent. So that's how you can use the chat. And depending if you are using the chat to send a private message, you can click in here where it says to beside there will be the name of all the participants available in that meeting. You can simply select everyone if you want to send a private or a public message. So everyone is public. And if you want to send a private, you will select the person accordingly. So if you want to close this, you just go at the top on the right side, click in this tiny arrow, close, and it will close that window for you. Okay, now for the polls. So the polls are going to be showing on the screen. It's gonna be a pop-up window. Uh, so when we are ready, if we can launch the polls. There you are. So here are the questions that you will be seeing in a few minutes. So the poll is very easy to answer actually. You will notice that beside each answer after each question, you have these circles that are empty. Once you select an option, it will show similar to what you see in the screen, right? It will show that kind of blue mark in there. And after you answer successfully every question, this submit button that before was kind of grayish will be now bluish. So you just tap in submit and that poll has been submitted successfully. Do you have any other questions about how to turn the video or even the audio at some point? You can always ask us in the chat. So thank you so much for your time. And yeah, I will let the experts take the lead now. Marguerite, you're muted. At this point now, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our content expert for today. Marnie Courage is an occupational therapist and the owner of Enabling Access in Winnipeg. She has more than 20 years experience. <clears throat> Marnie is a certified life care planner for accessible housing and home modification, aging in place expert, working on national projects to support Canadians with disabilities and older adults to live in place safely as they age. Thank you and take it away, Marnie. Thank you so much, Marguerite. I'm just going to share my screen here, so bear with me. Can everybody see my screen now? Mm 
too much yet? No. Now we can. Now you can. Excellent. Okay. Well, thank you very much for having me join this, this crew today. Uh, it's my privilege to be speaking to you on something that I'm really passionate about, which is supporting seniors, older adults across Canada to age in place and, you know, uh, to be able to live in their house as independently and safely as possible for as long as you wish or are able. So to do that today, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the support services that people find really helpful um, and hopefully can you can identify with some of the resources and um, services that I talk about today. So the first thing I want to talk about really is your health and, and well-being bucket. All of us really have this bucket and imagine that your health and well-being uh, are filled the, in this bucket, filled with the activities that bring you joy, bring you meaning, bring you purpose. Things like relationships and connection with others, uh, having good nutrition, laughing with friends and relatives, um, having good sleep, all of the things that rejuvenate you and bring you recovery. And then think about all the things that can drain your bucket. Those would be the stressors in life. All those things that are running through your mind of the things you have to do, those activities that you think you should be doing independently. We all have these shoulds and these really unreasonable lists of things that we need to get done in our day. And we want to preserve our independence in everything, but we only have this one bucket of energy and well being. So really we're left with two choices. One, you can refill your bucket constantly with all of those things that bring you joy, bring you good health and bring you good well-being. Or you can deplete and drain your bucket by using all of your energy on those daily activities that you think you must do yourself to maintain your independence and health. But what we're learning is that your body will actually force you to rest and will, you know, without that rest, you will, you'll lead to more injury and illness. So it's really not in our best interest to try to do everything ourselves forever. And, and that's the messaging that I think that some of you can identify with. So we all have changing needs as we age. And as you've heard already in your home modifications uh, presentation, our homes need to adapt with us as we age. And typically they're not set up well for us to do that. And so what we do is we adapt to our environment and that's really not the healthy way to age in place. So instead, I really want us all to think about prioritizing safety and accessibility in our homes to optimize this independence and well being that we all crave. So, adapting your home environment is important through aging in place adaptations that you learned about. But I, today, we're going to talk about really needing to adapt the daily activities, the how you do things, the how you accept help, and when you accept help, and how that can actually create a healthier you and a happier you. So I've broken our activities of daily living into some self-care activities. So these are the things that most of us need to do to stay healthy. So we have our bathing and, and hygiene and grooming routine, toileting, whatever that looks like for you. For some people who are incontinent, it might be about catheterizing, bowel disimpaction, all of these kinds of things. But really, it's your elimination uh, routines, getting dressed. You know, some of us are, are used to standing and putting our pant legs on one at a time. There's safer ways to do a lot of these activities that can prevent falls um, and can prevent hospitalizations. So eating and, and feeding yourself. And then there's healthcare management. These are those domains that we have to look at to really look at maintaining our full whole person health. And most of us concentrate a lot on our physical health, um, but I don't want you to forget about your mental health and social connectivity, our cognitive health and your spiritual health, because all of these pieces lead to us having better well-being and, um, and being happier as we age. So I just wanted to mention a few of the in-home services that people are benefiting from. And I really want you to think about 
could your energy be used better for getting out of your house and socializing with your friends and your um, the people that you love and participating in other activities so that you're not spending all of your energy doing your self-care activities that maybe take longer for you to do now than they used to? Um, so here are some of the, the services I know others have benefited from. In-home in foot and nail care um, services. Some foot clinics will deliver these services in-home or you could go into a clinic to get them done. Some public home care services cover this, this service and other people pay out of pocket for it. But it's one of those things that if you uh, have really good foot care, it's something that's not on everybody's radar until you have an ingrown toenail or something else that gets infected and can lead to hospitalization. So that's one of the ones I notice people forget about and can really benefit from. The bathing, dressing, grooming, and medication management is something that people typically know about. They know they can access public or private home care to get help with these things. But my advice there would be don't wait for there to be an incident, which is typically a fall or a major change in, in mobility, to start thinking about having those conversations. And it's often with your spouse or somebody you love to be talking about these conversations about is it time for you to have somebody come in and help you with bathing? And typically that's a dignity conversation and people say, no, I'm managing fine, but I promise you. And as you know, through all of the um, information you're learning through parachute, fall prevention is, is our biggest priority with safety at home. And it's bathrooms and bathing is the number one place where we're seeing falls. So then we wanna talk about diet and nutrition consultation. If we're not fueling our bodies with good, healthy foods that give us energy and are easy to prepare, we are going to be spending, we are going to look at shortcuts, which is usually pre-packaged, uh, well-preserved foods that maybe don't give us as much of that nutrition as we need. So it's great to have a consultation with a dietitian or nutritional consultation to be able to really decide what would be the right kinds of foods for you to eat specifically. So we've got private practice dietitians and some healthcare, public healthcare um, services will cover this consultation for you. So it's really tapping in to what's available in your region for public home care and public um, publicly available services. I'm sure this group has talked lots about fall detection and response services. But again, typically in my practice, what I've learned is it usually only comes after somebody has had multiple falls where they start thinking of these things. So as you're listening to me talk about all of these um, equipment and services supports, think about moving down that um, sort of idea of going from reaction to prevention. So I want you to think about how you can be more proactive and how you can help your loved ones be more proactive with some of these support services. So you're not having to put them in place at a time when emotions are high, like after a fall or a hospitalization. Just wanted to spend a moment talking about equipment, adaptive equipment that help us be more independent and safe at home. I could do a whole presentation on this, but just to let you know that one of the things I talk to my clients about is going to your home health care product vendors in your area to see what's available. Because most likely you won't know that you need something until somebody like an occupational therapist tells you, you know what you could use, or you see this in somebody else's house. But if you're someone who has tremors in your hand or has some shakiness or has arthritis, some built up cutlery to help you eat is really great. Um, this image here shows a picture of a scoop plate that allows people to scoop if you've had a stroke or you only have one hand available. There's a long handled um, shoe horn here that helps you put on your shoes. There's a picture of a bath seat that you could use in your shower to eliminate standing. There's a raised toilet seat that helps you get from sitting to standing. And this is a piece of equipment that is not just needed after hip surgery. It's really a preventative device to help you in, get it on and off the toilet. Then I've got a, an image of a bubble packed medication pack that you can get from your pharmacy. If you or somebody you know is having trouble with managing their medication or you're wondering if they're unreliable with taking medication, this is a great way to help you organize your medication. You can see very clearly if somebody has taken the medication. It's also a good reminder for yourself. Have I taken the medication? Ah, yes, it's not in the bubble pack. I've already taken it. 
So I find that that's a really great um, item to help with us, with all of our memories. And then we've got a long handled reacher here, which is just great for having not to step on a step stool or if you're somebody who's in a wheelchair to be able to get things off the floor. Like I said, there's many more products, but I would urge you to go visit any of your equipment vendors in your region. So let's talk about those home management activities. And I know for a lot of people, these are meaningful activities for you and that you've spent your life preparing meals for your family, doing the housekeeping, maybe doing your yard work, um, doing the laundry and doing those little jobs at home. But go back to that bucket. Is that how you want to spend all of your energy? If you have less energy than you used to have before, and these activities are really depleting your health and well being bucket, it is time to look for support in these areas. And I would say that most people wait too long and think, oh, I should have done this years ago. Now I have time to go to my bridge club. Now I have time to attend these Zoom mess meetings because now I have more energy and I'm not spending on all my meal prep. Where other activities. So remember that a lot of public home care services, if you're eligible, will provide this. And certainly those that have disposable income and are able to tap into private home care can get these services um, at an instant. So one of the things I teach people about is bulk meal prepping. So instead of you doing that once a week and depleting all your Sunday energy, hiring somebody or has, um, accessing somebody through home care to come in once a week and prepare your own meals the way you like them prepared so that you can use them throughout the week is a really helpful service. And then laundry service. I know people say, oh, well, I can do my own laundry. Again, come back to the time it takes you to do this and what you're getting from it. And is that how you want to spend your day? And for some people, it definitely is. But for others, know that there's a delivery service that most people can tap into where you can actually send your laundry away. You don't have to have a stranger come into your house and do it. You can send it away to be laundered and it comes back fresh and folded and ready for you to put away. I'd also consider meal delivery services. These are more common now than ever before. And these are services that um, there's national as well as local service providers. So you can get really great nutritional value in your meals. And maybe you just want it three times a week. You don't have to sign up for it, um, you know, seven days a week. And with the pandemic, we've learned about grocery delivery services. I know for my family, we are I've got small children. This has been a game changer. I don't have to spend my bucket of energy in the grocery store. I have moved completely to grocery delivery so that I am spending my time with my family, not in the grocery store. Yard care services, I know for a lot of folks, uh, this is meaningful activities for you. This is gardening and lawn mowing and snow clearing. But if it's something that is now taking its toll on you or your partner, then this is a great way to tap into these yard care services. And I wanted to tell you that they're available on demand. I know here locally in Winnipeg, uh, we've got a, a great service that people can tap into and it's just on demand. You call them the morning of and say, I want somebody to come shovel my walk. I like to do the light dusting, but we've had a huge dump of snow. This would be great for somebody else to do. It's a la carte. So you don't get trapped into these monthly uh, memberships. And then, <clears throat> excuse me, home maintenance services. We've got a lot of older adult seniors across Canada who want to volunteer to do these fix up jobs. So it's tapping into locally what's available. So I would urge you to do some, um, some searching online. If you're somebody, obviously, if you're on the Zoom call, you, you've got the technology capabilities to be doing that, to look for local services. And I would say, you know, Googling things or searching for things like, uh, snow clearing on demand in Ottawa, things like that. And you will get the services very quickly in your region that would be able to help you out here. And I just want to spend a second on community management activities. So like I said, grocery shopping, going to the bank, transportation, buying clothes and other um, kind of uh, provisions that you may need. You could tap into some transportation services in your region. There's a lot of nonprofit organizations who offer transportation for free for older adults. And so it's about what's finding what's, what you have locally. 
there's not a lot of national services. Most of the resources will be local to your city in terms of transportation, um, take that some group transportation that will take people out to shopping centers and to do their banking and things like that. Even if you're not living in an assisted living program, it's for you when you're living in the community. And then you can think about shifting to online shopping, especially for Christmas shopping, if that's some, or you know any seasonal shopping that you do. Now they've made it really easy to do that and they've made returns really easy. And I think that was something that was really hard for a lot of people, including older adults, is what if I buy something, I don't like it, how do I return it? So there's lots of options for folks here. And then your leisure act activities. This is the one that we know through the pandemic has been so important for us to stay connected. I urge you to stay connected like you're doing in this group here, reconnecting with your churches and temple and online worship groups, looking at games and other recreations that you can, recreational activities that you can do in person through your local age and opportunity and other um, older adults senior, and seniors. Um, resources available to you. And there's travel companion services now, which are so awesome, that are specific for older adults who want to travel, but maybe they've lost their spouse, but they still want to travel. There are companions, lovely people that I've met who will go with you on your trip and kind of act as a, a navigator for you and a companion. And they're really used to traveling and know the ins and outs and can help you be safe and, uh, and, and happy on your traveling. So these are the things that are really important to us and we have to look locally for what can we do to maintain these activities because this will fill your health and well-being bucket. I also want you to look at where you're getting your health information. Please do not get it from just social media and thinking, oh, there's this pandemic or this is something I'm supposed to do. Really tap into reputable, reputable sources. And right here, you've got CARP, you've got Parachute. Um, the other ones I have here, the Canadian Institute for Health Information and the World Health Organizations. These are reputable uh, organizations that can provide you with really uh, good information and trustworthy information about your health and injury, injury prevention, as well as services and supports for you at home. Talking to, to older adults across Canada, we know that over, over now, a quarter of seniors and, and older adults are, are worried if they're going to run out of money. So I urge you to talk to a financial advisor about your specific financial situation and what you can do so that you can have money to spend on these support services, on equipment, and on the things that you need to stay safe and happy in place as you age. Here are some assessments that you may be interested in, in uh, looking into as a proactive uh, plan for yourself. Occupational therapy, you've heard that we do home modification assessments, functional assessments, mobility assessments. Is it time to move from that cane to a walker or from a walker to a wheelchair? That's being proactive. Physical therapy or physiotherapy is looking at you know, all of your physical strength, are there exercise programs you could be working on? What can you do to maintain, maintain your physical health? Then we talk about the dietitians. Are, is a referral to geriatric psychi psychiatry something that might benefit you to look at where, where do, right now, what is my baseline for my cognitive and my psychological um, well-being? And do you have a family physician? I know so many people who haven't gone to see anybody in two years. So really looking at doing your annual checkups, getting your ears tested, and going uh, getting your eyes tested. I've left a few resources here. I know we are short on time. I could go on for days on all of the resources available, but I wanted this to be a snippet of information for you to start thinking about Moving from your mindset of, oh, I don't need that yet, to, hmm, I wonder if that would give me energy to, if I actually looked at having some of these services in place, would that preserve some of my health and well-being so I can engage in more of the activities like we're doing right now? So thank you very much for allowing me to, to give you a little bit of this information. I hope it sparks some really interesting conversations as we go into your groups today. Thank you so much, Marnie. Boy, what a great stage setter you've given for our topic today. 
And, and I just it, it have to tell you, I am meeting with my financial planner right after our session is over because it is, it is important. It's hard to afford these things and yet a lot are not costly. And uh, it, we have to pick and choose priorities too. So thank you for that. And now I would like to uh, reintroduce Christine Bidmead, my co-facilitator. She's gonna tell her story. Thanks, Marguerite, and thanks, Mani. And actually, my story um, does <laughs> reflect some of what you were saying. Um, and um, Diana, I think you are forwarding, that's it. Um, so um, nice to see some friendly faces again um, the, from, uh, from the previous sessions. And this was really, this followed on from our first session about the house, you know, your environment, a second session about your physical activity physical health and now about all of the supports that maintain our um, of our our ability to to look after ourselves so I wanted to tell you a story of what happened what happened to me last year um, this is me thinking I'm 27 not 72 um, I'm people tell me I'm a very positive upbeat type of person um, but last year I had a bit of a wake-up call and it was nothing serious but it did make make me think um, Nick, my husband and I, we keep busy. Um, we look after all our, our own house and garden work. We play pickleball a couple of times a week. We walk the dog every day. I knit, I sew, I read, and generally we enjoy life. And COVID arrived and suddenly anyone over 65 was to be careful, to be protected, and the world shrank. Um, our son, who lives 30 minutes away, kicked in and he came and brought groceries and checked in on us. And that was fine, but you know, it was not sustainable once he was back to work in, in, um, at his work site and he has two teenagers. Uh, anyway, I found Click and Collect with Loblaws and that worked really well. Vaccines arrived and life was going back to normal. And then last summer, I contracted shingles in my head and in my left eye. And I had had the Zostavax vaccine and it was not as effective as Shingrix and I'm getting Shingrix and that's another story. Our, um, our eldest son and his youngest boy were here on a visit from California after two years of um, restricted travel. Um, and this happened about three days after they arrived and I was really hit hard, um, especially with a lot of head pain and with my eye. I couldn't see properly at all, so I couldn't drive. I couldn't read, knit or watch TV. I was really lethargic. The medications that they gave me made me very, very dopey. And so I was generally miserable. I was not myself at all. Someone had to take me everywhere I wanted or needed to go. And I really used my health card more than it had ever been used over the past decade. Um, my son and husband both enjoy cooking. So they took over that. And that made me sad because I love to cook for my kids. And then one day we went to a different grocery store than my usual store, and it was a disaster. I was completely disorientated. I was really anxious, probably from the meds. Um, I was very unhappy, very uncomfortable. And although I rationally knew that this was temporary and that all of these factors had, had impacted on me, I was a mess. Um, Tony, our son, left after a couple of weeks. And a couple of months later, my eye was better enough for me to be able to drive. And I'm back to normal now, or as normal as I can, can be expected, according to my lovely husband. Um, that gave me and us a bit of a wake up call. Um, what if we were both in the same boat? What if this was temporary? I mean, what if this was permanent? And if I was on my own, uh, how would I have managed? Because I did have family around. The next slide. Normal service has been resumed. Um, I can drive, I can play pickleball, I couldn't see the ball, for example, to hit it. Um, I can read, I can knit, I can walk, I enjoy life, I'm, I'm back to being me. Um, but I had needed help. I needed help with transportation. We live in a village outside London. There is no bus service. Um, I would need a taxi or rely on friends. Um, and, I, and I think the driving thing hit me most of all because of the dependency on, on other people. Um, with shopping for basics, there is no delivery out here. Um, you have to go in and get it. You can certainly order it online, but you can't get it to you. Um, I certainly wasn't able to take part in any fun activities. Um, 
with care, such as food prep. I, I really wasn't in a state of being able to prepare food, but luckily um, the, the guys kicked in. Um, and I couldn't read the eyedrop instructions. So in eyedrop instructions, they have this folded up sheet in the box that is at about 0.1%. Um, um, the, uh, the font is 0.1, I think. It, it's so tiny, you cannot read it, um, which is really useful if you have an eye issue. So I wrote to the manufacturer about that and heard nothing. But, and I was confused, disorientated, and really uncomfortable in that strange environment. And supposing that had become my norm, um, I would need a carer to guide me. My sister passed away with dementia and that really brought it back to me that this must have been what she must have felt like at times. And that was quite frightening. So if we had both needed support to look after ourselves and our home, where and how would we get it? So we have started to think, um, both of us, and to consider where we live. And we do see a move in our future to a bigger village um, that has more to offer than where we are now. Being closer to our friends, because at the moment we, are, you know, we have to get out to, to, to be close to, to get together with friends. And then walking on mobility scooter distance to shops, etc. Um, so these discussions are ongoing and to be continued, but that is my story. Um, and it sort of really set that whole, yeah, I'm not 27, I am actually 72 and I do need to start thinking about these things. Um, so thank you for listening. And I hope that that generates some um, conversations in our breakout rooms. Thank you so much, Christine, for that uh, dose of reality and how quickly things can change for us. And how important it is to think ahead about some of these things. I do want to reiterate that everything that uh, Marnie has mentioned in her slides, that is part of the package that you will be getting. So if you have access to a computer, you can reach those. If not, you can take uh, go to your local library. They will help you. And another very helpful group uh, in your home area would be a home and community support uh, organization. They, they do tend to be all over by a variety of different names, but there are people who will provide volunteers to help. So now we have the stage set, the stories told, and we're going to break into small groups. Now, welcome back everybody. And I hope you had a good chance to at least stand up and stretch and get the blood flowing. I trust you were all able to take part in the conversation about the supports and services you feel you might need to age in the right place. It'll be interesting to see what the results are going to be. Uh, each group has a facilitator who will feed back your key messages. If a point or subject has been raised by a previous group, we ask that you not repeat it, but to bring us something new from each group. And I will ask Diana to start us off saying that you are a generation of great resourcefulness. What are you doing now to support your ability to live independently? What are the specific concerns that you have now about continuing to live independently? And what do you anticipate will become concerns for you in the future. Do you know what is available and how to access it? So you start us off, Diana. Thank you very much. We, um, I, I have to really thank my group. We had some very uh, honest and frank conversation. And I think that what really came out is um, uh, knowledge and that there is no unified um, access point to get the information that you may need for these services. That the it's sort of the access to the programs, and then um, like what are the programs available, and then how do you access them? And there was a lot of discussion about having a one unified source. And I'm going to even step it back a little bit further and say that even if you have are in a community that has great resources, does your doctor know how to access them? Does one of your friends know, you know, why don't we talk about these things more? One of our participants talked about that as a child, you have parents who watch over you. When you're a student, the school and the government has a role. If you miss school, you're 
you know, you, you're held accountable. If you go to on to greater ed or higher education, there, the colleges and universities pay attention to that. You are, uh, when you're working, you have a boss uh, or an organization that that is sort of checking in on you a little bit, if you will. But all of a sudden, when you retire or reach a certain age, it's kind of like we get forgotten. And uh, that that's what we we talked about. So it's the no coordinated approach was our biggest theme. Great. Thanks, Diana. Christine, what did your group come up with? So um, similar. Yeah, we had a really good group and good discussion. Um, I think, um, yeah, we talked about the, the being pre pre worn and pre armed. But I think one of the things that came up was actually the fact that sometimes you prepare for one person to go first if you're a couple. Um, and the fact that you sort of focus on that and actually you need to prepare for being uh, be ready for the, the other part because each each partner has their own role to play and um and and therefore you need to be able to to, to find the services that match the um the one who has sadly sadly left um and that's not always the way we think we assume that one person's going to go but maybe because of a chronic illness or something like that um so um i think i think that was something but the being being informed and being pre pre-warned pre-armed Thank you, Christine. Caitlin, what about your group? Hi, everyone. So I had a really supportive group. Everyone was very willing to assist the other person and come up with ideas. So it was very nice listening on, on that. Um, I had one person who was part of a dementia study, and it was a long process. Um, she was being very involved in it, and they were giving exercise guidelines and she said I was really following them lost it a bit during COVID but she's learning again how to get motivated to get back into it I thought that was really really cool to hear um, another participant um, up in Owen Sound was starting a co-op housing um, of people who want to live together it was multi-generational so all ages and it was just helping each other out I thought that was a wonderful idea um, lots of people doing Aquafit uh, to keep active. Um, one participant saw family members suffer a stroke, um, said, I, I don't want to do that, saw how they were really limited in certain areas, and they've decided to change their lives now and think about what am I able to do now, what am I enjoying now, and I guess they saw the, the heart or the reality that something might change, but I, I really liked hearing the reactive proactive aspects that this participant was able to incorporate. It was very interested and everyone was very back and forth on here's ideas, here's how I find <laughs> support for it. So very, very cool. Thank you, Caitlin. Kelly, how about your group? Thank you, Marguerite. We started out by talking about what's going right before we started talking about the challenges ahead. So what was going right for our group was people being very committed to exercise, to maintain their independence by maintaining their own personal mobility. We also had one person who said in a very clear uh, way is I pay people, which is that that's how she maintains her independence is because the task she's no longer able to do because of uh, arthritis. There are services that she has coming in to help support her stay in her home. One person brought up uh, a cautionary tale from a friend who suffered a, a quite a catastrophic injury and was in hospital without, uh, she's in BC and it's called representa uh, representation agreement. I believe in Ontario, we call it power personal care. But to have that kind of documentation lined up so that if you do find yourself in a medical emergency that there is someone who is authorized to speak for you. Some of the concerns from the future, a lot of them are surrounding transportation and also affordability money. Uh, we have one person who's in, uh, in a rent control department, but what happens if she has to move from that and enter into this overheated rental market uh, because of needing to change mm -hmm. location? 
Also a concern from folks in Ontario about the new policy that if you are hospitalized and to get you out of your hospital bed, you're put into a long-term care facility up to 150 kilometers from your home. That hardly allows people to age in place in their chosen community. So how to challenge that, what to do about that. Concerns about falling, a lot of concerns about while they were doing their mobility exercises, what happens in, in the case of a fall. Great recommendation for urban pole walking. We had a big group of urban pole walkers in our, in our area. But that issue of affordability, how long do you know? How many years do you need to budget for? What additional expenses may come your way if you require uh, more support than you do now? So that concern around affordability is huge. Uh, if you've got lots and lots of money, it becomes easier. But how do you afford some of the things? What services could be provided? There was a recommendation to review uh, what's available on the Services Canada website because there are certain supplements and things that seniors might not know about that uh, one of our participants recommended people look at. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly. Stephanie? Sure. Uh, so uh, similarly, we talked first about um, what what everyone feels like they're doing and right now and then talked a little bit more about uh, concerns. Uh, so similarly, uh, we talked about um, ways that people are, you know, staying active, staying connected, getting outside, especially in a since COVID world. <laughs> we had some debate on, you know, is, whether COVID, we can say COVID's over or not, but um, you know, more opportunities to get out. And I think we all appreciate that uh, since that time being being more isolated at home. And, and the idea that even if you kind of, the sense that you may even just have to force yourself to, to get out if you can and, and, and do things just to kind of stay, stay active and engaged. Um, we spent a bit of time on, on concerns, as I mentioned. So uh, most of our group uh, currently are, are living uh, quite independently at home. But um, you know, have fears around losing the ability to use stairs in the home, um, needing to rely um, solely on walking or using transit around the community. So um, not everyone drives all the time, but it's still knowing that you can drive when you need to sometimes, especially the way that communities are built these days, being very car focused. Uh, that was a concern. And, and also that conversation about, you know, when when am I going to have to move out of my home and almost feeling like that's an inevitability um, that, you know, you're going to have to downsize or move to a single level, you know, apartment or, or something like that at some point, or even thinking about relocating and downsizing, um, thinking about, you know, what what you're leaving behind when you pass away, what your, you know, your family having to deal with, with a home and all the things that come with it, some of those thoughts. Uh, so, so there was, you know, kind of this balance of, of looking ahead, but thinking about how to be proactive um, in, in, in thinking ahead of, of some of those things, especially considering what our, what our homes look like right now. Um, and we had a fair bit of conversation around, again, the sense of community and, and how communities are developed these days. Uh, so one aspect being kind of, again, that communities are really designed for, for cars. Um, and there's less connectivity. Uh, but then also the fact that um, a lot of people found that where they're living now, the neighborhood has aged and there hasn't been this mixing of new families coming in. New families are moving to completely separate, you know, small townhome uh, developed areas. So um, this idea that they would be, like to see communities more mixed where there are young people in the neighborhood that can help out with some of these activities or just connecting socially and, and connecting intergenerationally um, seems to have changed over the years. Thank you, thank you so much. Hey, Lynn. Yes, um, uh, similarly, people were mentioning various ways of staying physically active, being mentally and socially active and having proactive moves to ensure that they are independent. So I won't go in detail, they've been mentioned already, but while you're doing that and you have all the best intentions at the moment, then life happens. Uh, there was mention in my group of having uh, broken your wrist due to a fall, and while walking your dog and someone finding uh, herself in a situation of having being a, a senior herself, but also having to take care of an elderly mom. And basically the services are not there 
unless you have the funds. As we mentioned, affordability is a problem. But in this case, you have to fit the mold of what the services that are out there. Uh, and if you don't fit, there's nothing for you. And, and even when you do get those home services, it's like 15 minutes at a time, and that's not answering the needs. So the caregiving uh, burden is pretty high. And so what that leads to the, the concerns for the future is, uh, one is the affordability, as we mentioned, but also uh, who's going to take care of me is the question too, when you see when, uh, when you're in a situation where you're looking at how people are getting the services now, and that's minimal. So we, there has to be a rethink of those home services because right now it's kind of limited. And although we didn't get in details about that, but there was a hint that some people did have, oops, did have access to some services, but others did not know where to go. And especially for the free ones. Thank, Thank you. you so much, Eliza. Okay, so um, our focus group or our breakout group um, was largely um, independently living. Uh, and everyone felt that they were managing quite well right now. Um, but there was this uncertainty about, will they still have their health? Will they still have their um, mobility moving forwards? And, and specifically, what kind of problems are they going to have? So there was some kind of uh, amount of uncertainty in terms of what kind of services, if they do need them, what would they be? They also mentioned that um, they felt like they had uh, good support systems right now. So that could be family, friends, um, social support system, um, but whether or not that support system um, would be sufficient or would be able to assist them with anything in the future um, and would they need sort of outside support services like we're talking about today. Um, then we, uh, before we, we didn't have a lot of time but because uh, we did get cut off, um, but we were um, discussing where to find that information. And if people have heard of services, where have they heard of it? Um, so we had a mention of um, a sort of in public spaces and advertising, uh, mention of if you're part of a, a, some kind of organization. So for example, um, if you're part of the Diabetes Association or Alzheimer's Association, you tend to get notices about home care. Um, but if you weren't part of those types of um, organizations, where would you find that information? Um, community newspapers used to be a good source of uh, local services that are offered, but those are starting to um, disappear, especially from the smaller um, communities. Uh, and so there, there definitely needs to be um, uh, some work in the area of promoting resources uh, that are available. Thank you so much. And our final uh, facilitator, Nathan. Yeah, so I will try not to uh, repeat what's already been said. Um, I, I would say that the primary concern in uh, our group was um, a combination of a dwindling supply of services that are um, specific to the needs of Canadian seniors and uh, a lack of awareness of alternatives when those uh, reliable ones are no longer available. Uh, there was also some uh, voiced a concern about as someone who is aging into seniorhood or as someone who is uh, becoming a caregiver to a senior Canadian, um, just a, a lack of awareness of resources in general. And again, that uh, sort of a centralized area uh, place to go and with a, a comprehensive list of services would be invaluable in those kinds of cases. Um, there was a, a fair number of people who expressed that the uh, their own homes, specifically things like multi-story homes and stairs, uh, while they may not be an issue today, could easily become an issue. And especially with the concern that a sudden change in health circumstances could basically cripple their ability to be self-sufficient or to uh, provide for themselves or for those they are caring for uh, are very real concerns. And the lack of uh, sort of safety nets uh, for those people are a source of anxiety. Um, otherwise, there was a lot of uh, similar discussion of things like uh, a lack of ability to do tasks, whether it be uh, transportation related, uh, service related, or physical capacity. Uh, and finally, I would say that uh, there was, I would say, specific attention drawn to um, either the, the dwindling supply of services or rising costs of services, making them no longer uh, as feasible. 
Thank you so much, Nathan. And uh, as an older adult myself, I just had a birthday on the weekend. A lot of these things uh, apply to me. And I've been aware of many of the issues that you're talking about. Affordability is uh, a big one that has been mentioned many times. And one of the things that I'm really keen on is oral care, which is good nutrition, which helps keep us uh, strong and healthy. In Ontario, there is a program for older adults, but it is for those almost at the poverty line, uh, $22,000 a year uh, for, for singles and about 32, I think, for couples. And we are not going to give that oral health program until 2023 for older adults. And again, the threshold is a lot better. It's looking a lot better because when you're talking about the services, a lot of them are only for the very lowest income. And there are so many people who are above the lowest income, but not by that much. And a few hundred dollars here and there, a thousand dollars, is just a huge, huge setback. Uh, one of the things fear of falling was, was spoken about, having an alarm system is great, being proactive and having a support or care person in your life, knowing who or what that might be, and the downsizing, because our kids today, they just don't want our stuff. It's a, to us, it's treasures, to, to them, it's stuff. Uh, when people are looking at where they can get resources, um, I, I think also of the offices of your MP and your MPP because they know what is in your community. And the other thing uh, earlier I mentioned about whatever type of home and community services you can find, they do have different names, but they do tend to be around uh, and there's a lot of help there. If you have family health teams in your area, they would know where to go to that. So Christina, uh, did I miss anything there in the windup? To unmute, right. No, I don't think so. I think there's, it's such a huge issue um, and, and knowledge is everything. And yet, where do you find the knowledge and who do you, as I said in my slide, who are you going to call? And um, sometimes that's, that's the issue and the ghostbusters don't necessarily appear. Um, no. <laughs> So Michelle will be sending you an email. Uh, she organizes these sessions and all the information will be in there. But I would like to give a huge thank you to Marnie Courage for her expertise and guidance and to Christine for sharing her experience. Um, Michelle, Ellen, Eliza, Diana, Claire, Annie, uh, Stephanie, Kelly, and Nathan, all of you, thank you for making the session go smoothly. Uh, I do want to mention that we are going to have a French Zoom on February 2nd, uh, 2023, because I know we do have um, bilingual people here. And I'm going to give it back to Christine for a final goodbye. Just my thank you for being such a wonderful part of this. And thank you, Marguerite, for caring today. And um, yeah, I, I want to thank all the people who were on board uh, and the conversations I think we've had over the past three sessions have been really full um, and useful. And you know, the sharing and the, um, the involvement and the listening and the learning uh, have been really great. And we look forward to, uh, to putting that to, uh, to, to work with uh, feeding back to the funders just great. Thank you very much, Marguerite. And uh, it's been a pleasure working with you remotely. It's great. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, ladies. And it's Michelle hopping in here. I just want to give uh, Marnie the opportunity to, to give any closing remarks. I know we're at time, but those who can stay online, I uh, just want to give her that opportunity. Just one final thought as, as you leave today. I wonder if we can all think about switching that wording on the goal of independence and independent living and start thinking about supportive independence. It really still keeps the power with you, but allows you to think about supportive independence so that you can thrive. Thanks very much.